asset managers and analysts often refer to macroeconomic growth in market commentaries. Yet, is economic growth synonymous with performance? We have asked Michel Girardin, Professor of Finance at the University of Geneva, who doesn't quite agree with that statement. <laughs> no, yes, that's correct. I don't think growth necessarily uh, brings uh, good investment returns. And as you can see from this chart here, if we take the champion of growth, which has been China over the last 20 years, uh, then we see that it's been growing at three and a half times uh, uh, faster than, than the US economy. That's this uh, uh, red, uh, red line here on the right hand scale. And indeed has even grown faster than, uh, than the rest of the emerging markets. Uh, but nonetheless, the equity performance has been appalling. You can see this from the blue line on the left hand scale. The MSCI China has been underperforming over the last 20 years, the S&P 500, by 90%. So growth, economic growth does not necessarily bring uh, good investment returns. And that's not the only historical evidence. That's right. We also have, and we can see this from this chart here, another chart, uh, for instance, that, that there's a correlation which is not actually very high, very strong. Uh, between uh, between growth and uh, and equity returns. This is over the last uh, 100 years. And we have countries like Japan, who's been growing fast. We see almost 4% real per capita GDP growth over the last century. And equity returns have been, have been average. So this raises one question. Indeed, there's one historical example, which was the introduction of the railways in, in, in the US in the late 19th century which produced an economic boom. Uh, but the, 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 the performance of these railway companies at the stock market was uh, appalling. And uh, the reason was that this, uh, uh, these companies had taken on too much credit. So they had excessively levered uh, balance sheets. And so no cash flow generations and, and so terrible returns at the stock market. So this brings one question as to, okay, you have growth. But how do you make that growth? Is it credit, finance, purely? Uh, so if there's too much credit in the economy, then uh, you, can't, you can have growth. Uh, China is a good case in point, or Japan, indeed, in the, in the, in the 80s. We had zombie banks producing, zomb uh, you know, producing <laughs> financing zombie projects. And so uh, you get the growth, but you don't get the, the, the returns. So there are clearly other parameters. And how does one direct oneself in this maze of information? Um, I think it's interesting when you, when you uh, look at uh, four quadrants uh, on this compass here. Normally, when you have a compass, you take the safari compass here on the left hand, uh, of this left hand part of this chart. Usually, the, the north, the red arrow points to the northeast. That's where the growth lies. In, my, in the logo of my company, MicroGuide, I, I make it pointed to the northwest. The reason is that if you think of uh, the axis of the compass as the vertical one being the one where you have growth and the horizontal one, the one being where you have inflation, then on the, on the top uh, right quadrant, you have strong growth and strong inflation, a high inflation that's overheating. Then below, you have high inflation and low growth, that's stagflation. Then in the bottom left uh, quadrant, you have uh, neither of them, neither growth nor inflation. So that's deflation. Uh, deflation luckily on, on happens seldomly. So you can decompose that quadrant into sub, two sub quadrants, which would be the cold and, and the flu. So a minor uh, deflation and uh, uh, an outright deflation, which would be the flu. And the fairy tale that's on the top left quadrant, that's where you get strong growth and low inflation or inflation less growth. This is the quadrant where we find ourselves today. And this is the quadrant that equity market love. So you get the growth, but you get no inflation. So it's the Goldilocks scenario, as we say, you know, it's the fairy tale, le, le scénario boucle d'or, as we say in French. Why boucle d'or or why Goldilocks? Because Goldilocks, you know, the little girl that were, got lost in the, in the, in the woods and, and gets into the house and, and finds three bowls and, and she'd have a taste of the, the three bears. 
and she tastes uh, the, the, the big one, it's too hot, the, the smaller one is, is too cold, and the baby one from the baby bear is just perfect, not too hot, not too cold, just the perfect temperature. And so this, this is how, what we refer as the, as the perfect combination, not too hot, no overheating, not too cold, deflation, just the right temperature, you get growth, company generate earnings and cash flow, which uh, produce the good returns on the stock market. You get no inflation so that you don't have the central bank propelling interest, rate, uh, uh, interest rates higher, tightening monetary policy. And so that's the perfect combination for good uh, equity returns. So you've drawn a, a table that summarizes the relationship between the phases and the returns. And Indeed. what are your conclusions? Indeed, uh, the ideal, as I said, the ideal quadrant is where you, you is this fairy tale one is where you get that's the the the, the one which I indicate the bottom one here the fairy tale. You see that it happens about sixteen percent of the times over the last twenty years, and it produces uh, roughly fifteen percent uh, real in real terms equity returns. You see that the other uh, um, uh, point where you also have growth, but you have a strong inflation, that's the first, the yellow one, overheating, that's about uh, just under 50% of the times. It's still, it's quite frequent. Uh, it still produces uh, returns, but only half as, uh, as strong as in the, the fairy tale one. And you can also have, and this is where you see that growth is not, is not a necessary condition for for generating uh, returns because in the cold phase, which happens about 20% of the time, i.e. mild deflation, this is where you have central banks being really proactively injecting liquidity and bringing interest rates low, you may still get some, some uh, decent uh, returns. Indeed, here we see 12% uh, return on the stock market, which would be mainly liquidity-driven uh, returns as opposed to fundamentally driven returns like in the fairy tale uh, scenario. Which is what we saw in the last few years. Indeed, indeed. This is the perfect quadrant where we find ourselves today. The only risk to monitor, and indeed this is uh, uh, a risk to monitor, the risk to monitor, is the price you pay for this fairy tale. For the time being, we're pretty much reassured, even central bankers tell us they don't see valuation as being uh, outside of the norms. This is what Janet Yellen at the, at, the, at the Fed or even the people at the ECB are saying. But I think it's clearly one risk to monitor. In my view, the US equity market is now moving into the overvalued zone. It can stay there for a while. It can become even more overvalued. But I think there's two uh, equity markets which have somewhat stretched valuations. It's the US and Switzerland. Well, Michel, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Nicolette.